We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And we've been talking about for, well, actually the, the series is named St Stuck in Humanity, where I believe Christians are stuck in like a rut, stuck in the flesh. They've tried everything using their willpower, using all the principles and keys they hear from the faith gurus out there and trying to get somewhere, trying to establish something, trying for the breakthroughs, doing everything they know to do, and yet nothing seems to be moving. And if it does move, it only turned out to be an Ishmael. It came back and bit us and um, was a disappointment. And it only continues to create more frustration, more discouragement, more disappointment. And to, to the point, and every church has this, it's not just, you know, if, if it includes you, but all the churches, Christians come to the church and they're discouraged. There's, there's frowns on their faces. It's like another chore, you know, another part of the daily grind. It happens to be on Sunday. And this is not abundant life. It's, it's nothing of the abundant life. So something is wrong. I said there's a disconnect somewhere. And people are stuck in their humanity. And so they're looking for joy. They're looking for anything and everything that will just get them by. And that's just not, that's not the life that God, that Jesus died for. I mean, you have to ask yourself, you, you literally gave your life for this? This is, this is what it is? And I think a lot of it is wrong teaching. I think it's got the fact that we've got the wrong lenses on. We're not looking at it right. We don't have clarity of spirit in our, in our spirit man to see the physical. And so the end result is frustration, depression, discouragement, and people are stuck in their humanity. When God is trying to, to get the inheritance to us, trying to show us the abundant life, it's, it's not happening. And there's several reasons for that. We've looked at that over the last several weeks. But let me just recap because I don't want you to get lost in the series. Remember, this series is stuck in humanity. How to get God to manifest in our lives and get us out of the rut and get us into breakthrough, to get us to experience the, the abundant life. And some of the messages we looked at were being things like dead to our flesh. Because if we're in the flesh, God can't get, the Spirit can't get to us something that we're trying to get out of the flesh. So we talked a lot about being dead to the flesh, um, dead to the world, because we don't live in this world. We're not of it. We've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And if I've got one foot in, in the kingdom of this world and one foot in the kingdom of God, it's still not going to work. There's still, that's mixing, you know, and God's like, no, it's, it's on earth as it is in heaven, not half on earth as it is on earth. You know, it's, the focus is what God is doing in heaven. So we're dead to the world. Basically, we're dead to everything that's not of God. Now, you remember that. We, we talked extensively about that, that you and I are dead to everything in life that isn't of God. If God's not doing it, it's not something we are to be alive to. John the Baptist said, if it doesn't come from heaven, it's not mine. He says this in chapter 3 of the book of John. He says, if it doesn't come from heaven... I basically am not going to weep over it. I'm not going to mourn over it. I'm not going to give it any attention because if it doesn't come from heaven, my focus is not, shouldn't be on it. Because his disciples were trying to get his focus on something God wasn't doing. How many times does the church do that to you or your spouse does that to you? You do it to yourself. Your focus is on something that your flesh wants and God's not doing, so you're discouraged, you're depressed, you're frustrate, frustrated. So we're, we're, we were looking at that. And then lately we were looking at being dead to doing, which is another way of saying Romans 7, being dead to the law. And so we talked about in the last couple of weeks that if you introduce the law or live by law or you are alive to doing, it's a perversion of the gospel of Galatians chapter 1 around verse 6. Paul calls the gospel that they're preaching, the religious crowd, he said, it's not really another gospel, it's a gospel that's been perverted. It's the true gospel being perverted. And that, we talked about, is backwards living. Perversion means putting what's in front 
what should be in back and what's in back you should be putting in front and basically Paul's context of that Greek word perversion is they put the law in front and grace in back. And that creates a backwards living because everything you're doing from God is backwards. So you, you're, you're approaching God from the law of doing and how many do this and you'll get that. Do do this, don't do that. That's putting the law in front. And that's a perversion. Even if you go to church today or you watch Christian television and you've got this woman or man saying, here are six keys, two principles, two secrets. Well, that's what you've got to do, right? Those keys, secrets, and principles. Again, it's perverted. It's putting the law in front. You doing something rather than looking in the back and seeing grace is back there of what's already been done, meaning I don't have to do anything. Let's put grace in front and law in back and live this thing right. But it's not that way. Therefore, it's a perverted gospel that creates a backwards living. So I want to continue talking about this backwards living, but show you how to make it right. Put what's in back in front and put what's in front back. So we're going to continue that emphasis today. And when you have a perverted gospel, all you're going to do all your life, keeping that analogy alive, we've talked about trying to get into a room you're already in, that is your whole pursuit. You're going to try to keep getting something in your life you already have. Think about this. Um, even the simple things, there was a song, I loved it to death, and I would always request it in, in the um, early 90s. It was more love, more power. But see, I'm singing that song, more love, I want more love, I want more power, in reality, he can't give me any more power or any more love. So I'm trying to, I'm waiting for him to give me something, and my whole pursuit is pray more, fast more, obey more, so I can get more love, more power, when in actuality, I have all the power working within me. And all his love I got at salvation, it doesn't, he's not, he doesn't give me more of it. What the problem is, I'm not, my eyes aren't open to who, to all the power that's within me. My eyes aren't open to all the love that abounds. The, the length, the breadth, the height, the width, the depth of God's love. That's why Paul says, open the eyes of our understanding because you already got it. You're already in the room. Christianity today has always got you looking to get into a room that God already put you into. And that's every topic in the Bible because it's a finished work. It's already done. Now, being dead causes us to be alive in the finished work, receiving a kingdom, walking out the inheritance, and living the abundant life. Now, we also talked about what is it to be in God's will. It's the same thing in th from that perspective. People are working to get in the will of God. They're doing everything they can to make sure they cross their, their um, T's, dot their I's, do everything they've got to to get... When you're already right now in the will of God, Right now. So we've come up with this theology of God's perfect will, God's permissive will, and God, that has got to get out of our mentality. Because the reality of it is nobody has ever been in the perfect will of God if that's the case. Why create a perfect will, God, that no one will ever get into? How does that work? Talk about a miss. Well, yeah, I've got this plan, but it ain't never going to happen. But it's there. But no one ever will obey it because if you sin once, you've missed it. Yeah, but I can get back in. Yeah, but you missed something there. And then you're going to sin twice. Yeah, well, you missed something else. But I can get, yeah, they're always getting you back. We're never in it then at that point. Maybe for a few days till we sin again. And all these people that, have you ever taken a wrong job? You ever dated the wrong person? You ever went to the wrong place at the wrong time? Come on, we've all done that. Some have married the wrong person and ended up in divorce. But the problem is, who is in that perfect will? Because it doesn't exist. Right now, you have to see, and this is important to this message, especially when we get to the end of it, you got to see yourself as the will of God. I am the will of God right now. I'm not sitting here thinking, well, this is just a stepping, this church is a stepping stone to something bigger and greater. No, this is the will of God. For how long? It could be a long time. It could be a short time. It doesn't matter. I'm in the will of God. I am the will of God. No matter how discouraging things can be at times, 
or how bleak it may look, I'm in the will of God. Because we're going to develop this um, throughout this message today too. So when we understand that we are the will of God, every day your life is playing out what God has engineered and orchestrated from times past, from the beginning. Isaiah says he knows the end from the beginning. How does he know that? You don't know the end from the beginning. You don't know now. To, you know, if we would say, okay, well, I was stupid, but I'm smarter now. But you don't know now to the end. If you'd call now the beginning, you can't say you know the beginning from the end. Because you don't know the tomorrow. So how does God know the beginning and the end? How does he know that? Because he already prearranged it. Okay? He, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, re, recreated in Christ Jesus, meaning you're God's poem. And so therefore, your life is already written, prearranged. He already spoke the eulogy. These are all teachings we've done from the past extensively. And I've repeated over and over again. And you are God's poem, which means if I asked everybody here to write a poem this morning, you in your own sovereignty would pick out words, verbs, adverbs, prepositions. You would pick out um, all, you'd range all that and create this poem. But you are the creator of it. So every word was by your thought, by what you thought of. You, you sat down and put that word there for a specific purpose. So when he says you are God's workmanship, another Greek word for workmanship is you are God's poem. F.B. Meyer um, was the one who labeled that, found that. F.B. Meyer says you are God's poem. And that means that God took every aspect of your life, all your mistakes, all his sovereignty, all your faith, all your unbelief, all that he had planned, he worked it together and created your life, calculated all the bads, the goods, the uglies, and put your life together. And every day you are watching your movie being played out every single day. But what you've got to understand, as many of you will go home tonight and watch a movie on TV, you have no control over what the writer or the director has purposed in that movie. You're not at the end yet. You may be in the beginning and you're toward the middle and you're like, boy, if I, you can't change the movie, can you? And there are times in the movie you get mad. I can't believe he ended it that way. Huh? You have no control over the ending of that movie. You have no control over any aspect of that movie. Your life is being played out. And whether you want to agree with it or not, if it's already been written, there is nothing you have control over. Well, I can change something today, yeah, but guess what? You won't because who you are is who you are. Because I can go back 15 years and go, boy, if I knew what I know today back then, I wouldn't have done that. That's why you can't live with regrets. Should have, could have, should have done this, should have done that. You, Yeah, you can say that all day long, but you can't change that because that's not who you were. You didn't have that wisdom. You didn't have that revelation. You weren't that close to God to get a download to make something different. Your theology wasn't, wasn't what it is today. So even today, do you know it all? Are you going to make mistakes today? So don't give me this garbage about destiny is right now in your hands to formulate what path. You are your own master of your own fate. You better hope you're not because you don't know everything to make the right decision. And you better hope that grace is available because when you make a bad decision, that you better hope God calculated that bad decision so that in Romans 8 he says he can take that and work it to good. So I'm not worried about the will of God because I can't change the will of God. Even what I know today, I don't know enough to forge my way into a perfect path. Does that make sense? And that should set you free from a lot of religious garbage concerning the will of God and what you ought should be and do today. I, he knows who I am today. He knows where I'm going to be weak. He knows where I'm going to be strong. Hey, my strength can take me to a wrong place. You know, we're always talking about how weakness can take us out of the will if there is a perfect will of God. Well, my strength can do the same thing. Right? Now, then, this be it done according to your faith, what about that? See, we've always taken that scripture to mean that, hey, 
I'm going to miss out on a lot of stuff because I didn't have the right proper faith. So it be it done according to your faith. You can look at it that way, and there may be a little, there'll be an element of truth to that, but the bulk truth of that is, what does that mean to me now that I, am, I'm, I have a different lens on and growing in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ? That scripture takes a little bit different um, twist for me today in that my faith in what he did on the cross is what my faith in is what he's going to do and I trust him for. Not faith, well, I don't have a Cadillac because I didn't believe in one. I just didn't have a faith to believe in a Cadillac, so I guess I don't have one. I don't have a faith to believe in a paid off home, so I guess I don't have one. I'm not looking like that anymore. Just the, what the faith gurus make you fill out, you know, God's filled out the check, card blanche, you sign it, and you can have what you say. Be it done according to your faith. That is not how you see this thing. You see this thing as what I've been saying, God, what are you doing? How do I know what God is doing? Based on what Jesus did, I know what God's going to do. But I wake up every day, now not trying to create opportunities. I'm looking at what he's opening up for me. It's a rest. I wake up resting now because I used to do this over and over again. God, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want me to do? As if there's all this... I have to make my way. I've got to get the right and all. I've got to weigh the pros and cons. I've got to use my, my reasonings. I've got to keep an eye. Get the, get the temperature of what today is. Not physical temperature, but you know, what, what, what's working today? What's not working today? I, I don't have to worry about any of that. I don't even have to be smart. I can be an idiot, and, and all i got to do is say, Lord, what are you doing? And go right into it by seeing what he's doing. It's a big difference. See, it's, it's, it's been backwards. You wake up struggling another day, another dollar, you know, and another work day trying to make thing, make ends meet. And I'm like, no, you know what? I don't. Look, if I've got a Heavenly Father who's in covenant with me, who's out to bless me, do me good, He watches over His Word to perform it. He's, um, what's the scripture about the covenant? He doesn't alter the, the covenant, but his, his delight is in prospering his people something like that but um, I wake up saying I've got a God who's in complete control of my life and what evil's out there he can, he's going to turn it to good and what's not working is a challenge to manifest Christ to overcome what's not working you don't have a perfect life because you're in an imperfect world but when imperfection comes to you you say father what are you doing well, right now the finances have dried up Okay, what are you doing well, I know what he's going to do. He's going to provide because that's what Christ did. He became poor that we might become rich. So I know provision's on its way. And, and provision comes by me releasing that in my faith in his ability to provide. That's the nature of God. A promise is God's nature being provided in my midst. So I don't got to do anything except trust the nature of provision that's within me. He's Jehovah Jireh. That's his name. That's his nature. And guess what he's going to do when you're faced with lack of finance? going to provide. So my posture is, what are you doing? And he'll show me what he's doing, and I can flow in what that is. Now, that means at that point, whatever the Spirit tells you to do, you do it. But it's not you doing it, for it is God who has already done it, and has given you the grace to flow in what he's doing. It doesn't mean you're going to sit here passively and do nothing, although there's an aspect of that in the waiting part. But once he gives you the download of what he's doing, and, what, and whatever that is, you flow in that. See? Does that make sense? So, but what you already understand, you, you, once you understand it's already done, your part is to allow the Spirit to open your eyes to what he is doing, and then you flow from that point. So this takes the pressure off you. There's no work. The work that you do is the work he's already done that he's manifesting through you so you can enter into rest and grace. So um, remember Isaiah, God works for those who wait on him. Remember that scripture in Isaiah. Now, that's my introduction. Kind of get you on, you know, taking all those past sermons and bringing them to, to, to light to refresh and renew your memory and mind on it. Here's the dilemma people are going to have. I don't know what he's doing. I can't see what he's doing. Every day is the same day. It's like Groundhog Day, except, you know, a just different vocabulary, different words, 
different, you know, mindsets, but pretty much everything's the same thing. And that can be a discouragement if you don't have the right lens on. So what I want to try to do this morning is put the right lens on about your daily grind and about the fact I don't hear, I don't see, I don't hear, I don't see, I don't know what God's doing, I'm lost. See, that should not be the case any longer after this morning. So this might be a very important message to you today if you are discouraged, depressed, and frustrated about your individual life. And most people are. Because where's the frowns coming from? Where's depression coming from? Where's discouragement, anxiety? Where are all these things coming from if there is an abundant life? And Paul makes this statement. We are to be content in every situation. What does that mean? How do we become content in every situation and circumstance? And most cannot be. I saw one, you know, these, the, fa the, the Facebook stuff. You know, if I ever get on Facebook, it's because of this. These stupid ads. Not ads for commercialism, but these ads like, um, sin will take you further than when you, where you want to go, keep you longer than what you stay, and you're gonna, it's going to cost you more than you want. And I responded, well, that's, a, that's sad because everybody sins every day. So we're just all screwed. I hate those ditties. And I saw one the other day that said something about praise in the midst of your bad situations and circumstances. That all sounds good, but if you don't show people the revelation of that statement, it's just a stupid statement. that It, should, it ends up on a church sign that means nothing to 99.9% .9 of people that drive by because they don't have revelation of where that, what, that's, what that means. And they're putting all this stuff. And these key people have no... It just sounds good. And so what they're going to try to do is praise God while all hell is breaking loose without any revelation of what I'm about to show you. And they can't do it. You can't praise God if your kid is lying in bed sick. You're going you're gonna to bring in the worship team and do a jig while your kid's dying on the bed? But hey, praise God in everything. Be content in every situation circumstance. Count it all joy, my brother, when you fall into diverse temptations. How, I can't do none of that. Unless I'm not looking at the thing right. And even then, there is a thing called mourning. We live in an imperfect world and we're going to get stung by it. But we, get, we, we, we go into our inwards where Christ lives. And we pull up the faith necessary for every tragedy that can happen in life. And it will get us through. God, God is the God of all comfort and grace. And he gets us through. And, and it's not... It is a joy that's not based on situations and circumstances. That's not the joy he says, count it all joy. All right? So people make this statement, I don't hear God, I can't see what he's doing, and they're frustrated. But let me show you some stuff here. Just, again, re, re, renewing your mind. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So you're going to hear. Isaiah says there'll be a voice behind you that says, this is the way walking when you turn to the right or to the left. Romans 8 says, now that you're sons and daughters of God, you shall be led by the Spirit of God. And Jesus said it's expedient that the Holy Spirit comes. Why? He will lead and guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is there to speak to you what God is doing. So when you say, I can't see, I can't hear, you're lying. You just haven't heard yet. You just got to know, you got you to keep saying things. Rather than saying things, I can't hear him, start saying, his sheep hear his voice. His sheep hear his voice. Because at that point, you're opening up your spirit to receive. But if you go, I can't hear, I can't hear, well, there's one of those, be it done according to your faith. You're not going to hear because you keep saying you're not going to hear. You're not going to see because you keep saying I can't see. And out of your frustration, you're speaking your fleshly life. Start speaking the spirit life God designed for you to live. I know I hear his voice. And I'm waiting to hear his voice. Lord, what are you doing? Every day, 50 times a day if necessary. Under your breath, Lord, what are you doing? What are you, not what are you doing in frustration, but excitement of, hey, here's another day my movie is being played. What are you doing? What's this chapter going to be about? What's, what's around that turn? And you should have the excitement of your life as you do a, a, a move, an action-packed movie that Stallone or one of those guys wrote. You should be an expendable. You can't wait to see what you're going to blow up tomorrow. Huh? Or what enemy you're going to bring down today. 
or what strongholds coming down next week? What are you doing, God? I'll tell you what he's doing. Destroying the works of the devil, and that's what you should anticipate every single day. And he'll do it through you. You're his manifestation. Remember that? We are the manifestation, manifestation sons of God. That's who we are. We're manifesting on earth as it is in heaven. Destroying the works of the devil. So we're going to be able to hear his voice and see what he's doing. But here's another thing. Okay? So you say, well, I'm not, re I'm not really there yet, but I'm believing. Okay? I'm going, to, I'm going to change my vocabulary and I'm going to start believing my sheep hear my voice. Okay? Second thing that I want you to see in this thing being walked out in case God's silent. He's not always going to write things on the wall. You're not going to hear the audible voices. And you're not going to have that inward that voice a lot. You should, but where you're at, it's not a lot. Here's another thing I look at besides if, I, if my sheep can't hear his voice, say that I know that, but I'm not hearing his voice. Here's another thing I look for to see what God is doing. That we miss... Because you never hear anybody preach about it. It's called the providence of God. What is the providence of God? It's those things in your life that happen that you didn't initiate, you didn't engineer and orchestrate it, you got no, it just came to you. It's, it's just things that just show up in life. And you're like, wow, I, I never saw that thing coming. That happens more often than you know. We were talking about your job situation. So you had, there's a job in this city, there's a job in that city. So you sit back and you wait for the providence of God. What are you doing? And God says, I'll show you what you're doing. I'll, I'm doing by the door that I open. Now, not all opportunities and doors are God. But if you're asking and praying, and what are you doing about my job? What are you doing? Then when something opens, you go right inwardly. Is there a peace there? Is there like a, ugh, I don't know, ugh. Now i got to back off and revisit the thing. Okay, Lord, what is that red light in me? I'm looking for the green light. If there's peace, it's a green light. If there's a disturbance in my spirit about an opportunity, that's, that's you hearing his voice. That's the spirit giving you a, a oh, 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 whoa, oh, whoa, oh, oh, come back here. Don't be jumping off into that opportunity. That ain't me. Right? You've ever had an opportunity that wasn't God? So that's, that's, the, that's the Spirit giving you peace about something. If I, if, if I have an opportunity and there's no peace, I have no business engaging that. It's not a God. It didn't come from heaven. If it came from heaven, faith will arise for the thing, man. Excitement will arise. And then once you start walking, God opens more doors and the favor of God is there on that thing. You, you don't have the favor of God in creating Ishmael's. You don't have the favor of God doing fleshly works. How about this scripture? Every hand, everything your hand touches prospers. That's either a lie or there's a, there, there's, there's a disconnect somewhere. Because I'm going to tell you right now, most of what my hand has been touching for the last decade or so does not prosper. So that scripture, God's a liar. No, he's not going to give me favor on what he doesn't initiate. So I have to wake up. What are you doing? Because when I ask him what he's doing, I'm looking to what he's initiating. If he's the author of my faith, which means he's the initiator of it, and he's the finisher of my faith, he's the author of this day, and he's the finisher of this day. And I've got to know what the author, what the movie director, what the producer, who, whatever you want to call him, of my movie has worked out for me today so I can flow in it. Because I didn't write this. I didn't write this movie. I didn't write my life. Yeah, but you made the bad decisions. Yes, free will, but he calculated those bad decisions as made, made a part of the movie. So when he can say all things work together for good, he enters into my bad and mixes his grace and goodness and mercy and kindness and patience and long-suffering and produces a pretty good life. An abundant life is what he calls it. Now how can he promise you abundant life when he knows darn well you're going to mess it up? Because he's able to enter in, if you keep trusting him, even in the bad, he's able to enter in and work it for your good. Right? So providence is... So I'm waking up saying, okay, what opportunities are there? What? Well, okay, what if it's the daily grind? Today look just like yesterday. And tomorrow will look just like today. And next week will look like last week. And next month will look like this month. Because a whole lot ain't happening in my life. Guess what? 
It's still God in charge of the movie. Have you ever watched a movie and it, and, and the, and it just got boring for about 15 minutes? I mean, it was excited. It was great. It had your attention. And all of a sudden, what happened? Why did they change the, 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 the pace of the, of the movie? Why did they go another direction? Obviously, that 15-minute boring part is setting you up for an exciting part, but you've got to know this boring part for the exciting part in the next chapter to make sense. Or you read a book, and this chapter is like, man, that was a terrible chapter. But you needed to know the, the individual details that's in that chapter to set you up for the excitement that's coming in the next chapter or two down the road. See how this... So you can't... Do not... Give way to the pressure, discouragement, or frustration today when you say, another day, looks like this. No, no, no. Today may look like yesterday. The daily grind is every single... But understand, it's out of the daily grind that the breakthroughs are going to come. Just and The daily grind is simply your responsibility. Cleaning clothes, going to the grocery store, taking care of the kids, troubleshooting the kids. Yeah, do it. Because if God's got you in that mode, it's because it's part of the plan. And that's why Paul can say, do everything as unto the Lord. How can he say it? Because everything is of the Lord. That's why. Quit looking at your life. Oh, it's so terrible. And I'm just, ah. Believe me, I am the biggest bitcher and complainer in the last four years you will ever know. But I wish to God I had this revelation back then. It would have made my journey a lot easier. And I expect my journey to become easier, even if I don't get any breakthroughs. Because i got a different set of lens on I understand that I am the will of God right now. And I don't care what big mistakes I've made in the past, I am the will of God. Because Christ is in me. The minute Christ steps out of me, well then I'm not the will of God anymore. And he's not going to do that. He's there forever. I'm sealed with him. Fourth thing is, of course, which I said, when that's all the favor and grace comes. Now... What you got to do is determine when you're waking up every day and life is coming at you. You just got to determine what's God and what's not God, and that's through relationship. That's through studying His Word, hearing the Spirit. And I can't walk that. I can't do that for you. And listen to this: Jesus Christ and this relationship cannot be taught. That Bible is not a textbook to teach you about Jesus in the sense of what to do. It's not a textbook. And the church makes that thing a textbook. This thing can't be taught. It's got to be caught. And how's it caught? By the Spirit. You relating to Jesus on a personal relationship. And you'll be able to figure these things out. But if you're not relating to Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're not catching this thing. And all you see is right and wrong out of the Bible. You're going to be, you're going to be tossed all over the place. Because remember I said a lot of the stuff my hand touched did not prosper all that stuff was godly stuff now how is it I'm doing a right thing and he can't prosper it because I went to that Bible and made my decisions based on what's good and I did that and missed it because I wasn't seeing what God was doing because what's good may not be the exact thing he's doing so I can't go by well it's good do it well I'm gonna I'm gonna launch this ministry I'm going to feed the poor. Why? Why, why? Well, why not? It's a good thing. How do you debate that? Except, is that what God is doing? Yeah, God. Did you tell me God doesn't want to feed the poor? No, God wants to feed the poor, but does He want you to feed the poor? Maybe He's got you doing something else. And this is where we have the biggest problem in church is because we take our cues from the Bible, and I do it because the Bible says it's a good thing. And that's got, that, whole, that whole mentality has got to go. You replace it as, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, he's not going to have you create some um, moonshine business on the side, because we know that's not good. It'll always be good. You understand? It'll always be good. But you're not living by, I'm doing this because it's good. There's no relationship. There's no hearing. I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to go to Africa. <laughs> I personally, a while back, I had an opportunity to go do a radio show. Oh my God, I can get, get the message out on all the listeners, and it, we can, we can, we can uh, 
advertise the church. And, and, and it wasn't in my spirit. And I'm like, okay, there's, 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 there's no life on this thing. Not because it's a bad place. It's, and it, would, would that not have been a good thing to do? Would anybody have said, I can't believe that Greg Lilly getting on that Christian radio station and talking about Jesus. What is wrong with him? You'd never say that. But I said, I can't do it. It's not in my spirit to do it. And I declined. I said, maybe another, maybe another time, but I can't do it right now. It's, it's not what God's doing. Huh? The old Greg would have taken every stinking opportunity to do good. But not anymore. I'm saying, I'm, I'm the Lord, what are you doing? You're not doing that? Okay, I can't do that. No, he's not doing that. And I'm going by what's in my spirit. So this ought to be a, a term you use a lot. It's not in my spirit. I, an opportunity to work at a particular job. Not in my spirit. Yeah, but there's no, there's no money coming in. Because we don't know that tomorrow another one's going to open that's going to last longer, be more, or whatever. may not be longer, may not be more, but just may be where you're supposed to be in that time and season. Because that's going to set you up for a, even a better job because you know somebody. And I, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to broaden your, your sight here on this thing, on, on providence and trusting and how to maneuver and how to hear God and walk in what He's doing, not you forging the way. See, John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord. But Jesus went to the cross and prepared the way for you and me. Ephesians 2.10, prearranged life. You don't got to figure nothing out. You don't, God's not asking you to use your five senses and reason. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, to be honest, most people will never get out of that using their, their reason. Let me ask you a question. When God speaks to you, what does He speak to? Your mind or your spirit? Huh? Your spirit. So there is no reasoning involved. So never sit down with your mate or with yourself or with a friend and say, okay, now, what do you think we ought to do? You're, right off the bat, your reasoning is kicking in. And you're going to weigh the pros and cons. You're going to use common sense. You're going to use all the knowledge and information you've gained over the years of education in, in, in the world. And you're going to make intelligent decisions based on all that. But the funny thing is, God doesn't speak to that. So he's going to sit back and say, reason and do your logic all day long. I, I, I'll only speak to your spirit. Which means, again, he's not going to speak to your IQ. Or your ability to reason. He's going to speak to your spirit. And once your spirit gets it, then the mind gets renewed. The mind is secondary. We've made it primary. Again, backwards living. So that's, that's why morons can be more successful than intelligent people in the kingdom if they've learned to tap into hearing the spirit and not relying on their IQ. That's why he causes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because they're living by the spirit. And the wise is living by the reason. So your decision making is going to be... When you, when you, well, why are you saying all this? Because when you're making this statement, what are you doing today? He, you can't figure it out with your mind. Huh? You're, Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. Do you think he woke up knowing he was going to walk on water? Um, rather than not get in the boat with those disciples? And why not get in the boat? You show off. You think he was showing off? What did he accomplish walking on water for himself? Nothing. Nothing. And he had no clue till he saw the Father walking on water for himself, and he walked on water. And it didn't make any sense. Why do that? Again, why spit in mud? Just lay your hands on the guy. There's no medicinal purposes in the mud, right? Again, Jesus didn't walk by reason, because why? Why walk on water? Let me just get in the boat with the guys. Spitting mud and putting his eye cut. Yeah, that's filthy. That's dirty. Why do that? And you can go through the Bible and see all kinds of crazy things that God did that doesn't compute with your reason. I mean, look at Gideon. When he said, tie up all these foxes and put lights in their tails or whatever. I'd be like, really? 
Just give me some men with some weapons and let's go in there and take these Midianites down. Crazy stuff. I'll give you one more. He, goes to, he tells the Israelites to go to the Egyptians and plunder their goods. Ask for all their gold and silver. And they got it. For what? There's no merchandising and commercializing in the wilderness. They didn't get to use the money they took. They had to get water out of a rock and manna from heaven. They couldn't even buy the goods. So they got all this money to do what with? I don't know. Doesn't make any sense to me. They didn't use any of it to get to the promised land. It was all supernatural provision through the wilderness. So I, I, I don't know, but God said do it, and it didn't matter why or what. And again, what are you doing? This. Why? No, there's no why. You just do it. You saw something. Do it now. But the minute you hear God, or you see God doing something, and your mind sets in of what? You're, all, you're, you're, on, the, you're on the path of missing it right off the bat. Just do it. Just get there and do it. And don't worry about what it looks like, what the results are going to be. All you Remember I said, you, we're not even being concerned with the results anymore. Our focus is, what are you doing? And then I do it. And I don't care about the results or what it makes me look like. That's, I'm concerned by, what are you doing? And then go on, on earth as it is in heaven, right? Manifesting on earth what is in heaven. Um, I was in Arizona and I worked for this hotel and I did auditing at night. It only took me an hour. I got it down to where I, I really only worked for an hour and the rest of the time I studied, listened to tapes and, you know, got spiritual. Well, one, one particular week, you remember George Bush Sr., the president, his vice president. His name's, remember his name, couldn't spell potato? And that ruined his reputation, his in in intellectual reputation. But um, his brother lived in that town, owned a newspaper, Dan Quayle. His brother owned a newspaper. So he would come in a couple times a year, and we would be able to see the helicopter come in and land, and then here comes the Secret Service and the limousine, um, you know, take him wherever he was going to go. So he flew in, but rode around in the limousine. Well, we had the opportunity of housing the Secret Service. So I get down with my job, and well, I was told when I got there that they're gonna need two chairs. They're arriving soon. They're gonna, be, they're gonna need two chairs by the door. And I'm like, why? I don't know, just that's what they need. So we're getting everything ready for these Secret Service guys. So here they, they come piling in, they're getting their rooms, and here all of a sudden two guys come and sit down. So I'm doing my work, and then I'm done, so I'm gonna, they're just sitting there, so I'm, I'm, 23, 24 years old, so I'm going to ask them everything I can because I'm fascinated by this whole, everything I'm seeing happening. So I said, so what are you guys doing? What, why? Well, we're guarding the limousine. So every car that pulled in, they eyeballed that car. Sometimes they took a license plate number, but if anybody got too close to that car, they were up and just went out there. No one could come near that limousine. They were guarding that limousine. And I thought to myself, oh, that's got to be boring. And the guy said, well, I said that to him after I thought it. He said, yeah. He said, let me tell you something. If there's a particular parade going through a city, and we know, we know in weeks in advance the route and the parade, public won't know it till like a couple of days before. But as soon as the public knows, we have a guy guarding every garbage, garbage, those big green garbage things that businesses have. Their job is to stand there or sit there and guard that dumpster because no one's going to put a bomb in there and when it, when it drives by, ignite it. So they have guys guarding garbage. He said, think this is, have you ever had, think about having to sit there and guard a garbage dumpster, right? That's, that's laborious. It's like, but that's what? Their job. The word submit in James, where it says, submit yourself to God. The word submit, we've said a million times, is a military term. And it means to get into proper rank. Meaning, if that sergeant tells that buck private to dig 20 ditches for no reason, he's got to do that. Okay? Now, if 
God gives us this word submit. Submit to himself. Submit to him. Remember, we're not our own. Right? We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Your job is to serve him. As a son or daughter, you serve him. So whatever he tells you to do, what do you do? You do it. So that buck private sees the sergeant, hears the sergeant, and starts digging these holes. Or that secret service guy gets his orders to guard this garbage dump for eight hours and don't, get, don't take your eyes off of it. See, your life right now, no matter how laborious it looks, no matter it doesn't make any sense, why has he got me here? Oh my God, I could be doing more and I could be doing better and I'm just stuck here. What are you? No, 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 no. It's like, yes, sir. The fact that I'm here, I'm supposed to be here. I don't believe that. Well, then what do you do with the potter and the clay that Isaiah talks about, Jeremiah talks about, and Paul quotes in Romans? That's a, that, that's a truth. You're the, you're the clay. He's the potter. And the clay doesn't say to the potter, why are you making me this way? Read Romans 9. Why are you making me this way? Why are you doing this to me? Why do I have to stand here and guard this garbage dumpster? Why am I stuck in, in Fairmont? Why am I stuck in Clarksburg? Why am I stuck at this job? You're not stuck. You're in the will of God. And the minute he wants you out of there, providence begins to work. Opportunities come. He'll put a stir in you to start looking somewhere else because, hey, I'm taking you out of this. Or if you lost your job, don't moan the blues. Say, okay, what's my next orders? You, they didn't fire me. You ended this for me. I didn't get laid off. You're changing me. You're changing my jobs. I put a resume in for a job, Greg. Pray for that I get it. Okay? You didn't get it. And now you're pissed and you're mad at God and your family has to pay for it for the next two weeks till you get out of your funk. Wait a minute. Before you ruin two weeks of your life and make everybody in your house miserable, look at it this way. It didn't come from heaven, so it wasn't mine. Thank God I didn't get it. Nobody ever looks at that, that kind of stuff that way. I hear Christians moaning. They didn't get something. The God, I, I had my faith. I believed. And look what's happened to me. I went to college. I got into the FBI. Or I got into the Secret Service. And look what happened. I'm, garbage, I'm guarding a garbage dumpster. I'm guarding Dan Quell's limousine. And the guy can't even spell and he gets the rod in it. He'll never... See, that's just, you'll never ever live that one down. I, that was how many years ago, and I still talk about it for that. No, but anyway, you understand what I'm saying? Missed opportunities are not missed opportunities. They didn't come from heaven. It wasn't yours. You just didn't hear God, and you sent a resume in the wrong place. Who? Big deal. Hear God. See, I, 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 I've said this before, and... Um, I don't know if anybody believes me or not, but people who know me personally know this to be true. I was sharing this with, um, actually with my ex-wife, and um, sharing this because we were talking, and I said, you would know this better than anybody. I have never, ever looked for a job in my life. They came to me, and I began to rattle off all my jobs, and they, it was a phone, a phone call, someone called me, or someone said, hey, Greg's looking for a job, hey, I got one for him. But I never, had, I, I never had to go fill out resumes. Um, I, Channel 46 was my first job. I didn't go put an application in. The general manager called me on the phone and said, hey, you want a job? Yeah, I don't have a job. Yeah, I'll take it. My very first job, 18 years old. Even when I had the big church in Clarksburg, they came to me. This church here came to me. I didn't come to this church. So all my jobs that I've had came to me. And I've always wondered, God, what, what is the, uh, what, is that just a special favor I get no one else does? And I could never really figure it out. But now with what I'm learning, growing in grace, growing in the knowledge of Jesus, it totally makes sense now. Because when, when like, with, for instance, if I had this understanding today at 18 years old, I just graduated from high school. I didn't, I didn't feel led to go to college. So here's what I didn't know that at that point I was going to be going to, to, into the ministry. But here's what I would have said. God, what are you doing? What are you doing, God? Boom, and then a phone call would happen. I was taking classes in Morgantown to go to the mines. 
and work. And I got, I got certified, got the card and everything, just waiting for the call to go to the mines. And got the call two months after I got this job at Channel 46. But it wasn't in my spirit to take that because I, this is what God was doing. Because I, he was calling me into the ministry. I didn't know that. He used that TV station as part of training me in the ministry. So um, if I was saying, Lord, what are you doing? Boom, that opportunity came. Now I know what you're doing. That's providence kicking in. And any point in my time that I'm saying, God, what are you doing? He would open. And jobs are a big thing, are they not? You've got to make money. You've got to live. And he showed me one of the biggest things in life and showed me how never did you get one by looking. It, they came to you. By you just waiting. I mean, when I was living in Arizona, all I heard in my spirit was go back to West Virginia. And nobody could understand. There's nothing there. You got a job? No. You got a place to live? No. I had nothing. And everybody in Arizona said I was stupid. One lady prophesied that I was a dog returning back to my vomit. Totally taking that scripture out of context, but prophesying in the name of God. Greg Lilly, when he leaves here, he's the dog returning back to his vomit. I'm like, what? But I, Abraham left not knowing where he was going. And God set up a job for me that lasted nine months to set me in place. And then, boom, the big job at uh, the church in Clarksburg opened up. So God was showing me what he was doing by me sitting there resting in him, worshiping him, relating to him, and he was going to provide the way. See, that's, that's what I'm saying. Right now, you're probably thinking, what am I going to do? What am I, no, don't, don't get, no, what am I, you wake up, Lord, what are you doing? And look for the opportunities. That he, you can't create the opportunities. And if you really try to push through a door, you're going to create an Ishmael, go around the mountain a few times and realize, wow, I missed God on that one. But he said, that's okay. I want you to quit making your own decisions and start looking at what I'm doing. I've already planned it out. I've already mapped it out for you. Jeremiah says it's not within man to map out his own life, so quit trying to map it out. It's already been mapped out. Wake up and look to the Spirit to see what God is doing so you can flow in it because it's already done. Your jobs are already provided for. All your money's provided for. Your health is provided for. Everything's already been provided for. Why am I getting it? Because you've, you're, you won't get out of the flesh of doing it yourself. Long enough to let Him do anything for you because you're in the wilderness, in the flesh, creating Ishmael's. And God will let you take every job out there until you get to the right one. And I don't want to do that. I, it's my analogy I use is I don't want a machine gun. Hopefully I'll hit something. No, I want to be a sniper. I want to hit whenever I'm, I'm, what I'm supposed to hit. And not waste opportunities and time and money and pain. And, you know, I mean, pay, how much pain and suffering and agony do we go through by making the wrong decision? I'm, I'm at the age now where I want less mistakes, less pain, less suffering. So God, you don't got to worry about me forging the way. What are you doing based on what's already been done so I can flow in it? Does that make sense? So all this motivational, motivate me to do what? To get in the flesh and do something God's not doing? There's no motivational messages. God's grace will motivate you in the proper time and season concerning whatever opportunity opens up. Let me just close, let me close with this. Every place in the Bible, God initiates it. Let's start with Abraham. Was Abraham saying, God, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want me to do? We well, didn't pray that. All of a sudden, out of the blue, God said to Abraham, I'm, you, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. He, he wasn't seeking God. God initiated the thing with Abraham, showing that it wasn't based on Abraham fasting and praying, but based on Abraham just being and God doing the initiating. How about Moses? God put him in Egypt and trained him under the education of the Egyptians, which they were the richest nation, the smartest nation, and God had him pivoted at the perfect place to train him to be a deliverer. But what did he do? Was it God's will that he killed that Egyptian servant? No. So, boom, he goes out in the wilderness for how many years? Now, God could have said, sorry, buddy, you're going to die in that wilderness. You killed somebody. You made your bed, lie in it. But God is a God of redemption. And for whatever reason, it took that long. That's a season. And did Moses cry out to God? 
deliver me out of this wilderness? No. Concerning Moses, he was going to be there the rest of his life. How did God initiate Moses to getting back to Egypt? The pillar of, or the, the burning bush. So who initiated Moses? Who started the initiation? Let's put it that way. God. One day, he sees a bush burning and not being consumed. He's like, that's weird. And it's God. Gideon. In the wine press, honestly, bitching and complaining about the Midianites. And he's hiding from them because they're wiping them out. And then that angel comes to him and says, Oh, mighty man of valor. Who initiates Gideon? Does, it, does Gideon initiate God? No, he's bitching and complaining. God's not in unbelief. So who initiates the deliverance of Israel with the Midianites? God does. Huh? The disciples, fishermen, tax collectors, they weren't um, putting in resumes for being one of the twelve. Huh? Who went after them? Jesus did it. Jesus initiated them. That was their, their, their calling was their new job. So Jesus had twelve jobs open and took twelve guys out of twelve jobs and gave them twelve new jobs and called them what? Fishers of men. Who, who, who gave them the jobs? No resumes, no going door to door. Jesus went to them. Paul. Who initiated his salvation? Who initiated his calling? Knocked him off the horse. I'm telling you, your life's already been mapped out. You can't... Can I be at this? No. It's a choosing and calling and a prearranged life God has made ready for you. And he initiates everything. So what you do is look every single day to what he's initiating. By saying, what are you doing, God? What are you doing? And if nothing seems to be happening and he doesn't feel like he's speaking, then you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. You guard that dumpster till I say don't guard it no more. You're in this daily grind till he changes you to go to something else. You're at this job till something else opens up. So be content. You're in the will of God. And do everything as unto the Lord because everything is of the Lord. Now you'll know what's not of God when the devil comes and starts putting bad in your life. God's not out to do you bad. We know he's out to do us good. So when bad shows up, I look inwardly so God can manifest his nature to fix what's bad. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just part of life. You, you know, we're in this world, so there's going to be trials and tragedies. But there's also, all of them are always going to turn to triumphs. Does that make sense? I, I don't. I, I think that, that if Christians could get the you know get the backwards, get put in front what's behind them, and realize what the Bible says about God and who you are in Him and what He's done for you, this this should be a walk of rest and joy. And it's not because we have the wrong lens on. We're not seeing these scriptures. We're not putting them together rightly, which means we're not rightly dividing the word. So we're not coming out with the right lens. And so we're looking at life and we're confused about it. Because we think it's up to us. Mm -mm. See, the faith gurus get, got in my head in the early 90s and leavened the whole lump. So let me tell you something. I'm going to close with this. And I, I don't think I've ever said this to anybody or even... I got saved in 1978. And God's my witness. From 1978 to 1996... He rolled out the red carpet for me. You cannot imagine all the, not only the jobs, but the opportunities that I got. I got to be on radio. I got to be on television. I got to go on mission trips. I got, a, I got the chance to be a pastor of one of the largest churches, charismatic churches in the area. Um, I mean, the experiences and all the stuff that God allowed me to have the, that period of time, I, it, it's just like, I don't get it. And I didn't make any of this stuff happen. God initiated them all. But from the mid-90s onward, I got smart. I started listening to these faith gurus and all these, some of these legalists, still holding on to grace, but thinking that my faith works. And I got into a faith works. Rather than the faith trust, I got into faith works. And I got smart to where... I looked at that Bible, and it's a good thing, and everything I launched out, I prayed, I didn't hear anything, but I launched out anyway because it's a good thing. 
And it's me. See, I made, my, I made decisions thinking it was faith, and it wasn't faith. It was just me doing something that looked good, seemed to be right. How can you debate it? And nothing ever worked. That's why I said the first however many years that is from 78 to 95, 796, whatever my hand touched prospered. Honestly, it did. But from 96 to just <laughs> even today, it's like, what the hell happened? Did I lose my salvation? That's the only thing I think of, and I know I didn't. So what gives, God? And, he, and, and, and just recently, he opened my eyes to what I'm sharing. That, you know, you have never saw what I was doing. In the first stage of your Christian walk, you didn't need to because you were young. You were wet behind the ears, and I led you. See, it says that, G, that God led the children of Israel through the wilderness. He led them to Meribah, bitter waters. He led them. And he led me along the way. It wasn't everything wasn't always cake and ice cream, but it always turned into cake and ice cream. You know? But he was leading me. So then I got smart thinking, no, I, I'm still being led, but I'm I'm using my faith now, and I'm going to make these decisions based on my faith stepping out and got into that faith groove for a little bit. I couldn't get rid of it. I'm telling you, once you get that faith message, the, 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 wrong, the wrong faith message from these faith teachers, you get that in you, it's hard to get out of you. And everything I did just didn't seem to work. Because you know why? I wasn't having the mentality, what are you doing? I was having the mentality, what's good and what's right is what I'll do. And really what I want to do. What do I want to see happen? What's the end result that I want to see? Well, then I'll work my faith with these principles and keys and secrets to get that thing to manifest. See how I wasn't, see how that's backwards? I don't, I tr for, for the last 15 years, I've been trying to figure God out. And it, like this church, what do you want me to do? What do you want? And I, I've never heard him say anything. It's because he's, it's already been done. He's not going to tell me to do anything. He wants this, this mentality to be reversed of what are you doing? What he's doing is what's being done right now. You might not like it. I might not like it. But guess what we're doing right now as a church, small as we are? Guarding the dumpster. And no one sees me in that back alley guarding that dumpster. But if I'm where he wants me to be, I'm giving him the glory necessary. For whatever reason, the Bible says promotion doesn't come from the east or west. Where does promotion come from? God. So if he says guard that dumpster, I'm guarding that dumpster because promotion comes from him. Not from you, and not from another church, not from a denomination, and not from wealth. So if promotion comes from God, I best be doing what he's doing. Right? And right now, what's happening in your life, right now, is what he's doing. Minus the, the, the works of the devil. Okay? Yeah, but you know what? He led me this... He, he, I prayed, I knew it was God, and, and it didn't turn out like I wanted it to. That garbage dumpster stinks, doesn't it? Can you at least get garbage that smells good? I gotta sit there and smell that for eight hours. Did they not know that it was gonna be hot that day, that week? Heat wave? See, none of that see he says he led them to the waters of Mirabah. You know what Mirabah means? In the Hebrew, bitter waters. Now, why would God, who's leading them, it says he led them to those waters, and when they drank it, they spit it out and began to bitch and complain to Moses. Well, did not God know those were bitter waters? Yeah. What gives? Doesn't make any sense. All they know, it was the, the palate, palate or whatever, it, it didn't taste good. Right? But what we found out History-wise, they didn't know at the time. What we found out is that in those waters was a chemical, I forget the name, that cleansed them. You can go to GNC and get a cleansing to, to rid you of the toxins and all that. There was a chemical in those waters that caused them to have diarrhea, that caused them to have a cleanse happen to them from all the pork that they weren't allowed to eat in Egypt and all that garbage they got in Egypt in their bodies God gave them a cleanse as they were getting ready or as they were going through the wilderness. It was for their benefit, but they couldn't see. Why? See, what, 
when you see God, God's not always going to put you in rosy patches and put you on paths you just need slippers. No, tough shoes for a tough trip. And sometimes God will put you in situations that's tough. But it's necessary. Somebody's got to guard the dumpster. Someone's got, and then it could be because he's setting you up for something bigger. Well, he always is setting us up for something bigger and better. He never takes away. He only takes away in order to establish something new and something better. So I just want you to just be happy about your life. See, this faith guru says, this is what you can have. And guess what? You're not having it, and you're mad. I've done everything Kenneth Copeland told me to do. Creflo Dog, I've done it all. And nothing seems to work. Well, because the focus is wrong. You think you're a second-class citizen because you're not getting the goods. Reality is, you've got all the goods you already are going to ever get and have. Now, just look for God to manifest them daily. And what you don't have is what He's not doing. Grow up. Die to the desires and the worldly flesh and lust and passions that you've arrived by being in Egypt. Let the Spirit cleanse you by letting Him take you where... You're, this thing for four years I've gone through that I have detested these last four years is my waters of Mirabah. He led me here. Well, but He didn't cause you know, this, that, and the other. No, He didn't, but He knew that it was going to happen and calculated it and it was part of my movie. The movie ain't over with yet. Huh? Bruce Willis is going to come through. He got that saw it. He got that gun taped to, the, to his back. I saw it. Huh? Let's stand. Father, we thank you. You are sovereign. And you are in complete control of our lives. You've already mapped them out. And we are overcomers. And Father, we cause this message to put that seed of truth in us that we can start manifesting contentment in every situation and circumstance. The important thing is to know is we are in the will of God. And when bad things happen, we just release heaven on earth to change those bad things, destroying the works of the devil and manifesting God's provision and goodness in our lives. But on that daily grind and opportunities and things of those nature, those things of that nature, Lord, you're in control. We're, we, we're not, it's not up to us. It's not up to us. We rest in the finished work. We rest in that the book's already been written. We're just waking up every day being led by the Spirit, asking, Lord, what are you doing today? It's not what i got to do. It's what you're doing based on what you've already done. What a deliverance that takes place in our spirit once we get this. A rest and a faith arises we may never have had before. I know it has happened with me. I'm not worried about trying to do anything anymore. Now I'm looking for providence. I'm looking to see what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And listening to my spirit within, my spirit man, for the red light, for the green light, whether he's going to disturb my peace or give me a faith, if there are a couple opportunities to arrive at the same time, or even just one opportunity, it may not be you. Father, we rest in you. Why? Our life is hidden in you. Christ in us is the hope of glory. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.